Well, it's been 14 months since I've been in the pulpit here preaching. Any questions? <clears throat> Last time we were here, we talked a bit about encouragement. This is, this is part two of a two-part sermon. <laughs> and I'm glad I can get to it this morning. You know, all it takes is a casual reading of Scripture to get the impression that God is committed to the proposition that if he's going to get the job done, he's going to get it done through us. That as Methodist people, he's given us his word, he's given us his indwelling presence, he's given us the power of his Holy Spirit, and he's given us the body of Christ. So from that we can make the case that we are fully equipped to accomplish all that God would ever have to do through us. And interesting too that those four resources are applicable anywhere around the world, regardless of the resources that people have. You look over at 1 Peter 2.9, and the Lord says that we are part of a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Why? That we might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 2 Timothy 2.21 says that we are vessels of honor and sanctified. Why? so that we might be useful to the Master, prepared for every good work. Even as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself up for me. Last year when we talked about encouragement, we talked about it from the idea being that it's something more than just a good idea, more than just a Jeremiah 29 11 written on a day spring card and mailed to a friend. But it was a matter of spiritual survival, making the case from 1 John 5 19. Can I have 5 19? That we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And if that's true, then we could very easily make the case that we live in enemy territory. And if we live in enemy territory, then that would also define our relationship with one another as we encourage one another and build up one another and pray for one another, be devoted to one another. But to live in a world, even as Jeremiah 2 or Jeremiah 7 says, would you just advance those up there? Thank you. How'd the gospel make it out of Jerusalem without a clicker? <laughs> if we live in enemy territory, then we would say from Jeremiah 7, that is it possible to walk backward and not forward and not know it? Even as each of us, each of us walked into the sanctuary this morning, I doubt if anybody walked in here saying, I am now walking into the sanctuary forward. But if I asked everybody to leave the sanctuary backward, everyone would be cognizant of the fact that you're walking backward. And we live in a world that it's possible to walk backward and not forward and not know it. Jeremiah 2 says it was a people who walked after emptiness and became empty. Ask somebody today if they're feeling full or empty in their lives, and you may have people, very unregenerate people, say, oh, I feel very full, but is it possible to think that you're full when in reality you're empty and you just don't know it. I think of Paul over in Corinthians who says that spiritual things are nonsense to the non-spiritual mind. There's just a completely different perspective if we live in enemy territory. Even in Matthew 7, where Matthew says, records the words of the Lord to say that the gate that leads to destruction is wide and many who enter in, but the gate that leads to life is narrow and few who find it, which leads you to ask a serious question. What in the world are so many people doing entering into a gate that leads to destruction? Is there a big sign above the gate that says, Welcome to Destruction? Or is it possible that the gate that leads to destruction looks better than the gate that leads to life? It's all a deception in this world. Or from 1 John, who would say it's possible to think that you're in the light when in reality that you're in the darkness. As a matter of fact, you can even say that you're in the light when in reality you have never left the darkness. And if that's true, you would think that you go along with Paul over in Corinthians also, he says, to test yourselves, to see if you're in the faith. I wonder what the agenda would be for a person to test themselves, to see if you're in the faith, lest 
They say that they're in the light when in reality they're in the darkness. Over in Romans 1, where he says you can claim to know God and not honor him as God. I wonder how that's even possible. To know God and not honor him as God. All it would take would be a casual reading of the Exodus over numbers even to see the people who the scriptures say put the Lord to the test ten times for asking according to their own desires. Imagine that. After 430 years of praying to be delivered from Egypt, they're finally delivered. They make it out of the, into the wilderness. Their needs are not being met so that they start complaining to Moses. They put God to the test. He delivers and they start singing his praises by a rock gushing forth with water. A few days later, they're awfully hungry, so they start trashing on Moses again. Can't he build a table in the wilderness for us? Let's go back to Egypt. All in favor, say aye. And Numbers tells us that they put God to the test four times. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Also in Romans 1, where it says that they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Imagine that. Imagine, the, imagine exchanging the truth of God for anything, let alone a lie, which would lead you to ask the question, what's the nature of a lie if there are people exchanging the truth of God for it, which would presuppose that somebody has the truth and they want to give it up, which would also tell you that it's possible that the lie looks better than the truth. Go back to the garden. God says to the man and the woman, whatever you do, don't mess with the tree. Because if you mess with the tree, you're going to die. The tempter comes along and takes the most detestable thing in the eyes of God. How many things do they have to deal with? Just one thing. Absolutely detestable in the eyes of God to mess with that tree. Now, if you're Satan and you want to come into creation, you want to come into perfection and destroy what God has created, what do you bring with you? What do you bring out of hell to destroy what God has created in perfection? The nasty nine, the filthy 15, the ugly umpteen, what do you bring with you? He brings a lie. As a matter of fact, he brings a lie that looks better than the truth. As he says to the woman, you shall surely not die. As a matter of fact, you think you've got a hot spiritual experience going on here now? You haven't seen anything. Just mess with that tree and you'll know what God knows. Fascinating to me that the tempter tempted the woman with a spiritual temptation to have an experience that's greater than the experience she was having. That the object of her faith wasn't God. The object of her faith became her experience with God. And do we suffer sometimes the same disease? Even as the writer says, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. If all of this is true, then what we need to encourage one another day after day while it's still called today, lest we be carried away by the deceitfulness of sin. And so that which was detestable to God became a delight to the eyes and desirable and able to make one wise. Is that possible today? Is it possible that the most detestable things in the eyes of God to this generation, in this world, in enemy territory, can become a delight to the eyes and desirable and able to make one wise? If that be the case, then encourage one another day after day while it's still called today, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And they messed with the fruit, and they were removed from the garden. Let's look at it a little bit differently. Go back to the garden and ask the question, why did the Lord create the garden in the first place? What was the magnificence of the garden? Was it the vistas, the, the scenery, the trees, the, the, the flowers? What was it about the garden that was so beautiful? Why did he create this thing? Or is it possible that he created it as a place, as an expression of his very nature, that God is one and all of creation was a manifestation of the oneness of God. So here's the, the man and the woman individually. The scripture calls us as being created body, soul, and spirit. That they were one. That they were one as husband and wife. That they were one with creation. Creation in them. Them and God. God in them. The entire garden was saturated with the oneness of God. And so if you're Satan and you want to come out of hell to destroy what God has created... You bring a lie with you, but what's the objective of that lie? 
What's the focus of that lie? What's the target of that lie? To give the man and woman a bad day? Or to destroy the target being the oneness of God? And what does the scripture say? She took the fruit and she ate. You know, isn't that interesting? Because God says, when you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. And the woman took a bite of the fruit, but what didn't happen? She didn't die. Isn't that kind of confusing to you? Except I wonder if that's because they were so one that it says when she took the fruit and handed it off to the man, he took a bite, and the next word in your scriptures is then. I wonder if they were so one that it took both of them. Because it says then the eyes of both of them were open. Then they know good and evil. We refer to this as the fall, don't we? And when something falls, something breaks. And the oneness broke. The oneness between the man and the woman, them and creation, creation and them, them and God, God and them, it all came unglued. And from that moment in time in the garden until another moment in time when the Lord comes back again, and I trust that you're not looking forward to the Lord coming back, are you? Especially when Thessalonians says that when he comes back with his mighty angels and flaming fire to deal out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who are not called according to his purpose, who would want that day to come? The mighty angels and flaming fire to deal out retribution to those who do not go. And does anyone here know somebody who does not know God? And you would not want that day to come for that person, then would you? And so from the garden until the mighty angels in flaming fire, I get the impression that God's got a plan. We go, because from the garden, Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. And so something happened in the garden when the oneness broke and sin entered into the world. Now everyone who comes along on the path of life also comes along on the path of death. And so then what's the answer to the problem? Well, the law shows up. Is the law any kind of a help to us? Sure. Galatians 3.24 tells us that the law was a tutor to lead us to Christ. The the law was a tutor to to define who the person was who would hang upon that cross. The law puts all of us under sin. And it defines the sinless one. The law was absolutely necessary. Was there atonement for sin? Was there faith? Did they love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? Did Caleb and Joshua follow the Lord fully? Is it possible under the law to step off that path of death by faith in God, loving him by being obedient to the law and experience life? Because if you say no, then you've got to come up with where Moses and Elisha came from on the Mount of Transfiguration. Then you've got to define all those people from Hebrews 11 who by faith and by faith and by faith did all kinds of incredible things. Could somebody step off the path of death simply by being obedient to the law? No. Obedience is always an expression of something. It's an expression of love. And they were faithful unto God. God was the object of their faith, not their experience. And they expressed their love to God by being obedient to the law. The the, the sin was covered by the blood of the sacrifice. But what couldn't the law do? It couldn't stop people from dying. But it defined who would hang upon that cross because now... The cross has come. Jesus has been an atonement for sin. Now can a person step off the path of death by faith in Christ, loving him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, and expressing that love by being obedient unto Christ? Sure. That's what salvation is all about. The object of our faith being God and God alone not our experience with God. Anybody can pull off that. I mean, what did they say to Jesus? Didn't we heal the sick, raise the dead, do all kinds of stuff? And Jesus said what? I never knew you. But what couldn't the cross do? The cross couldn't stop people from dying. People are still dying, aren't they? And there's going to be a day when the mighty angels in flaming fire show up. And the clock stops. So between the cross and the mighty angels and flaming fire, i got to propose something. A question to ask, does God have a plan? And then I would have to ask another question because I get the impression from Scripture that Satan has a plan also. 
I'd like to propose what God's plan is. You have your scriptures? Turn over to John 13. Do we have John 13 up there? Next one. Good. Can you read that? If you're over in John 13, then you'll know. How many of you guys have red letter Bibles? Red letter Bibles? Only, good. Then you'll notice from John 13, 31 all the way to the end of John 17, there's a whole lot of red letters. Because you'll notice in John 13, 30, that Judas has just left. And guess what he's doing? Because he comes back in John 18, 3 with the troops. So for, between John 13, 30 and John, John 18, 3, these are Jesus' last words to his disciples, and you'd probably get the impression that last words are lasting words. And so if you would want to understand the, the plan of God for the day between the cross and the mighty angels in flaming fire, I would wonder if, if, if John 13 through John 17 would tell us. Well, just a casual little look at those verses. Look what it says. There's 125 verses. And in those 125 verses, there's 118 references to the Father, 263 references to the Son, 242 references to the disciples, 28 references to the Holy Spirit, for an average of 5.6 references per verse. And the example, just I threw in a verse there, the one that's up on the screen. When the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that the Spirit of truth who proceeds forth from the Father, he will bear witness of me. You get the impression? And then look at the references. Look at the relationships. There's 41 references to the relationship between the Father and the Son. 30 between the Son and the Father. 14 between the Father and the disciples. 11 between the disciples and the Father. 75 between Jesus and the disciples. 68 between the disciples and Jesus. 6 between disciples and each other. 10 for the Holy Spirit and disciples. And 3 the Holy Spirit to Jesus. Over and over and over again, you get the impression that God's plan has something to do with a relationship of some kind, and not just any kind of relationship. Because what did he create in the garden? What is the very essence of who he is? Pick, look over in John 17. At the end of John 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples. Imagine this conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples. All of a sudden, I'm not sure what the context was, if they were sitting down or standing or huddled up all together. I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden, the, Jesus stops talking to the disciples. John 17, 1 says, he lifted his eyes and he started talking to the Father. Wow, talk about being upon holy ground. Here's Jesus talking with the Father about the disciples who were standing right at his feet. Listen to this. Father, I manifested your name to the men that you've given me out of the world. They were yours and you've given them to me and they've kept your word. Now they've come to know that everything that you've given me is from you and the words which you've given me I've given to them that they've received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believe that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I don't ask on behalf of the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. And all the things that are mine are yours, and all the things that are yours are mine, and I've been glorified in them. I am no more in the world, yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in the name which thou hast given me, that they would be one, even as we are one. Now let me ask you a question. How one are the Father and the Son? Pretty one. Would Jesus ever pray a prayer that wasn't possible? No. He has just prayed that they would be one, even as the Father and the Son are one. Now, John 17, 20. Father, I don't ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who would believe in me through their word. Now who is he praying for? You. That they may all be one, even as Father, you are in me and I'm in you, that they would be in us, that the world would believe that you sent me. And the glory which you've given to me, I've given to them, that they would be one, even as we are one. I'm in them, you're in me, that they would be perfected in unity, that the world will know that you sent me. Now let me ask you a question. What do we do today to communicate to the world that the Father sent the Son? We've got big programs, we've got big buildings, we've got big activities, we've got bumper stickers, we've got billboards, we've got all kinds of stuff to communicate to planet Earth that the Father sent the Son. And here are the disciples standing around the sun, and he prays that they would be one. Why? So that the world would know the Father sent the Son by the oneness that they have between each other. 
It's called fellowship in the Spirit. I'm not talking about kumbaya here. I'm talking about the very plan of God. If he's going to take the world, he's going to take the world through you. And he's going to take the world through you in relationship to the brothers and sisters around you, the body of Christ. That's why scripture says one part of the body can't say to another part of the body, I have no need of you. Well, who's the head of the body? Well, Christ is the head of the body. Then could we say that not even Christ would say, I have no need of you? That if I'm going to get the job done, I'm going to get it done through you? Is it true that the eyes of the Lord move to and fro across the sanctuary of the Spring Arbor Free Methodist Church that he might strongly support those whose heart is completely his? Is it true that he really wants us to be vessels of honor, sanctified, useful to the master? Imagine that. Imagine wearing a t-shirt, useful to the master. Can't you just see the Lord coming up to you and say, listen, if I'm going to get the job done in this community, in this situation, in this organization, in this classroom, I'm going to get it done through you. I've given you my spirit. I've given you my, my presence. I've given you my word. I've given you the body of Christ. You're fully equipped. Now go take the world. I get the impression that God has a plan between the cross and mighty angels in flaming fire, and it's not all that complicated. I think it has a lot to do with people in relationship with one another, and it's described as being one. You know, it's possible to follow the Lord and not follow him fully. The whole nation of Israel pulled that off. But with Caleb and Joshua, where it says they followed the Lord fully, it doesn't mean that they followed the Lord perfectly, but they felt they followed the Lord on his terms and not on theirs. The object of their faith in God wasn't their experience with God. What was the nation of Israel? Were they complaining about their experience? All the time. And it's, and it's true it's sometimes in the church today. But the object of our faith isn't God, it's our experience with God. You ask somebody how they're doing spiritually, guess what they'll describe? Their experience. Good experience, good faith. Bummer experience, bummer faith. Where on earth did that come from? Here's the Apostle Paul sitting in Rome in jail, facing the death penalty, and then what does he say? My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Well, where did that come from? It sure didn't come from his experience. It came from his faith and his faith alone. And God is looking for a handful of people in which the object of their faith is Christ and Christ alone. And then they stand together. Because the scripture says, the world will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. That they would be one even as we are one so that the world will know that the Father sent the Son. I was going to speak at some church in Flint. I'm on my way. I'm along the highway there. There's a billboard for that church. Guess what the billboard says? We do church right. Oh, please. Take the billboard down, please. You know what they were saying? Come to our, our hot, we got a hot experience here. We do it right. You guys already know this, that four or 5,000 churches a year close their doors in the United States. 85% of the ones that are staying open are losing members. 15% that are gaining, 14% are gaining only because people are hopping from one hot experience to the next. 1% are getting saved. We're addicted to spiritual experience. When the Lord simply says, be fully devoted to one another. Give preference to one another in honor. Praying for one another. Serving one another. Husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church. And he loved the church by being a servant. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. That, I believe, is the plan of God between the cross and mighty angels in flaming fire. Now, I also believe that Satan has a plan. Turn over to Mark, Matthew chapter 16 and I'll hit it real quick. Matthew 16. Remember, this is the passage where Jesus goes up to the disciples and says, Hey, who do, who do the people say that, are, that I am? And they answer a few things. And then, who do you say that I am? And then, you know, Peter says, Well, you're the Christ. And Jesus pats him on the back and says, You know, on this rock I will build my church. Hands him the keys of the kingdom, so on and so forth. Verse 20. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Critical. Because Jesus didn't come to set the bondage of the Romans free. He came for a 
whole other different redemption. So when it came to the Messiah showing up, he didn't want a bunch of people rioting, thinking the Messiah is here, so therefore we can go to war, and none of us are going to get a scratch on us. Shh, don't tell anybody just yet I'm the Messiah. Because he wanted them to know what it meant for him to be the Messiah. Because the definition of Messiah isn't to set up the kingdom just yet. Then he tells them what it does mean. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he needs to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, raised up on the third day. Because guess what the definition of Messiah is? To die. He could have healed everybody on the planet. He could have preached 24-7. He could have served everybody around. But unless he died, he would have not accomplished his purpose because the purpose of the Messiah was to die. That's why the law was a tutor to lead us to Christ. He would be the one who hang up on the cross. It wasn't an animal that sinned. The animal's blood just covered the sin. But now we needed somebody to come to the cross to obliterate the sin. And that would be Christ. He had to die. Now, the question might be, I wonder if the object of Peter's faith was God or his experience with God. Because Jesus has just radically redefined his experience with God. Because he's been following Jesus for the last three and a half years. And now what did he tell Peter? Where I'm going, you can't come. Peter's response? He took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord, that this should ever happen to you. You ever wonder who Peter thought he was talking to? God forbid it, Lord, that this should ever happen to you. He may as well have just said, you forbid it, you, that this should ever happen to you. But I wonder what he was saying when he said that. Was he looking out for Christ or was he looking out for his own experience with Christ? We get a clue because we see what Jesus' next words are. Get thee behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block to me. What? Now we have the definition of Satan. If the definition of Messiah is to die, the definition of Satan is adversary. Satan is always an adversary to the purpose of God. Whatever God is doing, Satan is always an adversary to it. In the garden, in relationship, doesn't matter where it is. If God's doing this, Satan is an adversary to it. And if Jesus has just defined the fact that he needs to die, then I'm going to presuppose that Satan is an adversary to the death of Jesus. I don't think he mind if Jesus lived. I mean, go back to the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. Hey, you look awfully hungry. Let's turn these stones into bread. Just don't die. Hey, I bet you want a bunch of people to believe in you. I've got a plan. Why don't you just throw yourself off a cliff? We'll get a bunch of bleachers and the sound system. The music will be incredible. Worship. I will be in charge of the worship. And before you splat to the ground, we'll have the angels swoop up out of heaven, set you down. You can preach a sermon. People will be going to faith like it's going out of style. Just don't die. Then he takes them to a high place, shows them all the kingdoms of the world. And by the way, the scripture says, all these kingdoms that were given to me, Satan says, all these that were given to me, I can give to whoever I wish, it says in Luke. Jesus, he takes Jesus to a high place, says, see all this stuff? All of this is yours. You're a kingdom kind of guy. Let's set up the kingdom right here and now. Just don't die. Was it Satan's to give? Absolutely. First John 5, 19, the entire world lies in the power of the evil one. Just don't die because Satan was an adversary to the death of Christ. He would do whatever he could to keep Satan, Jesus from dying. Even to do this. Look what Jesus says. Get thee behind me, Satan. I can understand that part, but watch this. You were a stumbling block to me. What's your question? I thought stumbling blocks were for weak Christians. You know, something that they struggle with and don't do it, you know, don't, you know, don't do it in front of them so that they would be tempted to sin. Aren't stumbling blocks for weak Christians? Question number two. What in the world is Jesus doing with a stumbling block? Question number three. Wouldn't you want to know what it is? Why would you want to know what Jesus' stumbling block is? Because if Jesus had a stumbling block, the chances are pretty good that we've got the exact same one. And then he goes on to define it. Jesus' stumbling block was the closest person in his life 
setting their mind upon the things of man rather than the things of God. In other words, they were into the relationship for their benefit, not the person's. The closest person, Jesus' stumbling block was the closest person in his life, Peter, setting his mind upon the things of man rather than the things of God. Now I've got another question. Do I have the closest people in my life? Have I surrounded myself with people that are setting their mind upon the things of man rather than the things of God and hindering me in my part in the role of being one between the cross and the mighty angels in flaming fire? Is that a stumbling block for me? The closest people in my life setting their mind upon the things of man? Next question. And the question I never want to recover from. Am I that person? Am I a stumbling block to the closest people in my life, to Becky, to the students at Spring Arbor, by setting my mind upon the things of man rather than the things of God, and setting my mind upon the things of man, or setting my mind upon the things that I benefit from in the faith, that the object of my faith isn't God, it's my experience with God. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. That was the lie and they exchanged the truth of God for it. Well, we have the definition of Messiah to die. We have the definition of Satan, adversary. Now the last slide. Now the definition of disciple. Jesus does a fascinating thing here. He says, there's a group of people that I would like to have between the cross and the mighty angels in flaming fire to stand here, one, so that the world will know that the Father sent the Son, so that the world will know that we are his disciples. And he defines what it means to be a person who stands in that place. And the definition of disciple is to die. You can have the hottest experience on the planet. You can have the best voice, the best preacher. You can have it all. But the definition of disciple, the one who would be one, if anyone wishes to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Why is it essential for a disciple to die? You want to know why? Because Satan can't tempt a dead man. If you're alive in your experience, you're alive in your, I don't care. He loves it, just don't die. Go to the nicest church in Spring Arbor, just don't die. Go to the best Christian university on the planet, just don't die. And then, between the cross and mighty angels of flaming fire, he looks for a handful of people to stand. Because if you were to take your spiritual tape measure and hook it on to the garden, and drag it all the way over here to the mighty angels in flaming fire and say, how big is this? How big is it from the garden until the mighty angels in flaming fire? The Greek word is this, huge. Now this is the miracle, you guys. This is the miracle of it all. Because take the magnitude of from the garden all the way to the mighty angels in flaming fire, take the hugeness of that, guess what God does with this? Is this his plan? Is God at work? He takes his plan, and guess what he does with his plan? His plan reduces down so far it comes down so, the hugeness of it reduces down so far that it fits perfectly well into the heart of a man. And God takes this man. And this guy here, you guys, this is the miracle of the ministry. The miracle is that the, that the purpose of God fits perfectly well in his life. And you know, and you uh, And you know what the devil would like for him in this moment in time? To worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Just don't die. And yet God would take this man in the same way that purpose fits perfectly well here. This man. (laughs) 
between the cross and the mighty angels on flaming fire, he fits perfectly well. God puts him here because he's part of a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession. Why? So that he might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called him out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer he who lives, it's Christ who lives in him. Right? But guess who he needs? One part of the body cannot say to another part of the body, I have no need of you. Because he's susceptible to an evil one who wants to keep him from dying. And he needs people close in his life to encourage him. Why? So that he'll have a good day? So that he'll be blessed? No, so that he'll be about the business of the purpose of God until those mighty angels in flaming fire show up. And we're praying, oh, hang off one more day. Because there's a whole bunch of kids here in the youth group that need this man. And he needs to be encouraged, he needs to be prayed for, he needs to be built up. He, we need to do everything we can because this man is fitting smack dab in the middle of the plan of God until the angels show up. And I want to stand with him. That's called fellowship in the spirit. We're not talking kumbaya here, we're talking spiritual warfare, spiritual survival. We're talking about the plan of God. We're talking about mighty angels and flaming fire. We're talking about an evil one. And you know what the hindrance will be? If I'm setting my mind upon the things of man rather than the things of God, what good am I for him? No good at all. We can sing Kobaya all day long and it doesn't matter. He needs me to have my eyes fixed upon Christ so that I might serve him as he serves our youth. That's what's called fellowship in the Spirit. Amen? Amen. It's just the two of us, I guess. I guess so. Two's better than one. And a cord of three, th three strands is not easily torn apart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this fellowship of believers. We don't gather together on Sunday mornings just to get liver shivers and, and, and have our experiential expectations met. We gather together as the body of Christ to be fully involved in your purpose on this planet until you come back again. And by the way, don't come anytime soon, please. Hold your mighty angels and flaming fire off just another day, please. Find your people faithful. Whether it's in a Roman prison facing the death penalty that we might say that the gospel has turned out, the, the, for my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. It doesn't matter where we're at. You've given us your word. You've given us your spirit. You've given us your presence. You've given us the body of Christ. We have everything we need. And now help us to hear from heaven. Go take the world until I come back again. Heavenly Father, find us faithful. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.